Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and to today's video which admittedly is a little bit niche it's not the usual sort of video you guys are used to seeing from me but after having shared some little snippets over the last maybe nine months or so of me making my own scented candles at home lots of you guys have expressed an interest in knowing like my process and how much it costs if it's cheaper than buying scented candles how easy it is to do how time sensitive it is all of that kind of stuff so i figured i would just make a video and kind of answer all those questions for you by no means am I an expert candle maker. This is not my profession. This is just something that I decided to do because I am a big, big lover of a scented candle. The house doesn't feel like our home unless there's a scented candle or two going. So I spent so much money on scented candles over the years, I thought I would give this a go. And also we now live in the countryside, so I am a regular little Martha Stewart, minus the jail time. So first things first, I thought I would go through some of the bits and bobs that I use, some of the equipment that I use in order to make my scented candles. The first and most important of which is the melting jug and pouring jug. This is essentially where you're going to melt your wax and add your fragrance oils and then you're going to pour this into your container. Now the most important thing, I will link all of the items if possible because some are old but I will link as much as I possibly can down in the description box below the video so lots of further information and all of the items that I use will be linked down there. Um, but the most important thing I would say about your uh, pouring jug and melting jug is that it should have a little lip on it because we're dealing with hot wax, essential oils, fragrance oils and if you don't have the little lip for pouring it's just going to get really messy and wax is a bit of a bugger to clean up unless you leave it to properly harden. So yes, that would just be my main tip for your pouring jug. The one I have is a big three litre jug just because I like to make massive 3.2 kilogram candles. I'm a big fan of a big, big candle. So I try to get as large a measuring jug as humanly possible. Next up is a thermometer with the stick on the end. I've got no idea of the technical terminology, so if you've come to me for all the professional stuff, you best leave now because <laughs> I do not do professional terminology. And I'm sure there's also gonna be many people that wanna chirp up and tell me how my method is wrong. But you know what? All of my candles that I have made thus far using this method and using these tools and these products have been, um, I'm going to toot my own horn here, but they've been absolute perfection. They have smelled delightful and they have burned perfectly without, oh, no oh, fly, no shoe fly. They have burned perfectly without sticking to the side of my container. So I'm just going to say I'm quite happy with my process. Now, yes, back to the thermometer with a stick on the end. It's the sort that you use for sticking in like meat to test the temperature. I'm gonna link this one below. This was just a cheapy one that admittedly I bought because it was the cheapest one on Amazon. I'm gonna link this below, but I would not advise buying this particular one because mine is very temperamental. I press the button and sometimes it comes on, sometimes it does something completely different. So it is a little bit temperamental. It takes about 10 times longer to actually do what I need it to do. So I would advise if you don't already have one of these or if you wanna buy a specific one for your candle making kit, to get one that's probably a little bit more expensive that actually does a good job. But you're gonna need this in order to test the temperature of your wax because that is a very, very important factor of making your own candles. Measuring jug, that one, we are going to need, not for the wax, but for the essential oils slash fragrance oils, whatever it is that you choose to use. So this is actually just a measuring jug, glass one that I pinched from my baking cover because I've done absolutely zero baking since we moved here. So this has kind of basically moved into my candle making kit. 
Scales and a bowl for on your scales. I'm sure lots of people already have scales at home and this is for weighing out your wax, which I'm gonna get to in a moment because it's a little bit of trial and error. Um, if you don't know the size of your container and how much wax your container holds, I'm gonna to touch on that again in a minute, so just bear with me. Right, so I'm gonna to touch on wax in a minute, um, but your fragrance oils is obviously something which is really important. You can either buy a fragrance oil or you can get essential oils. From the research that I have done, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, you've been invited to correct me if I'm wrong here down in the comments, but from the research and the bits that I've read so far, essential oils, you can use in scented candles, but you need a lot more of the essential oil and essential oils are more expensive than a fragrance oil, which are specially designed for things like scented candles and reed diffusers. They're a lot more potent, if you will. Um, so it's actually more cost effective to use a fragrance oil rather than an essential oil. That's what I have sort of read so far. Now I use one main uh, candle supply wholesaler. I use this for the majority of my sort of real candle making items that I buy, including the wax. It's called Supplies for Candles Online. I will link it down below in the description box. They have got lots of different fragrance oils on there, lots of fragrance dupes, so dupes of uh, well-known designer fragrances. I made one the other day that was a dupe of Tom Ford Neroli Portofino, which was a very like summery fragrance that I had a few years back. And I have to admit, although I don't still have the fragrance now, it did remind me a lot of that fragrance. So the fragrance dupes are really good. And um, they also do just really classic scents like lavender, coconut, bergamot, and you can mix all those together. They do woody ones, they do citrusy ones, floral ones, really sweet and sickly if you like things like vanilla or candy cane lots of seasonal at the moment they're bringing out a lot of their halloween ones so i've bought a couple of autumny fragrances so that i can get ahead with my candle making and i can have some ready for when the autumn season kicks in and they do the only thing that i would say is that their measurements are actually in grams which is odd because it's a liquid uh, so just for reference this is a 500 gram uh, container of one of the fragrance oils this, I believe, what size is this one? This is 125 gram, and this one is a 50 gram. Now, depending on the size of the fragrance oil that you buy, the larger the container, the less it is per gram. So I often tend to go for these 500 gram containers just because I think it's more cost effective. Uh, the only thing obviously to bear in mind with buying that size is that you need to either be making really big candles or you're gonna just get a lot of candles of that one particular scent. So if it's a scent that you really like, for example, linen, like linen fresh, that's always a really good go-to, then that would be a really good size to sort of buy. But if you're buying a festive scent, I would go, which I have one here, it's called Merry Morning, I would go for a slightly smaller one because you're only really gonna be burning that candle during December. Then on to wax, which obviously is an absolute essential. Again, I buy my wax in bulk from Candle Supplies Online or Supplies for Candles Online, I think it's called. And originally I was buying this one here, which is called Parasoy. It's a paraffin and soy mix. Um, for those of you that don't know, paraffin wax, it's not used a lot, but it's mainly used in really cheap scented candles. Um, that's the wax to avoid if something is just totally 100% paraffin wax. Um, it does contain some chemicals in there. It's, it's not supposed to be very, I don't really know all the science behind it, but it's supposed to not be very good to have paraffin wax candles burning for long periods of time, especially if you haven't got any ventilation, you haven't got any windows and doors open. Um, it's not supposed to be very good for you. So that's one to avoid. This one is only 
um, a small amount of paraffin, the majority of this wax is soy. And this comes in, again, various different sizes, but I tend to go for, what size is this? I think this one is the 10 kilogram. Yeah, this is a 10 kilogram slab. So it comes in solid form. And the thing that I really like about this is that especially when you're doing kilogram candles, which as I mentioned before, I do the really big 3.2 kilogram candles, you have this little cutting guide. So you can basically put this on your slab and you can cut the amount that you need, which is really, really handy. So you basically don't need your weighing scales. Now recently I bought this wax, which is called Pro Soy. And the thing to look out for when buying your wax is to make sure that it is a container wax, not a wax for wax melts or something else. You want container wax. And the reason that this is important is, is because it's to do with how it burns and you don't want it sticking and causing like that little gloopy sort of archway within your container. You want it to burn seamlessly, which every single one of my candles has done so far. And I have used both of these waxes. So these two waxes I can 100% um, guarantee or not guarantee I can't guarantee it don't go complaining <laughs> to the supply company but I can put my name to them and say that I would recommend these waxes now the good thing about this wax the pro soy is that it comes in little like little droplets little pellets if you will so it actually melts a lot quicker than this solid wax, which you basically have to hack at with a knife and chip blocks off and then put it in your melting pot. So this is the one, I think this one is a little bit more expensive, but this one is definitely one that I would recommend for ease and for speed. Right, now in this bag of goodies, I've got a plethora of things. So you're gonna need wicks, and wicks come in lots of different forms, lots of different sizes. Uh, because I like to make really big candles, I have some really long wicks here. Some of them come waxed. You can get paper wicks, which make that sort of crackly, sort of log fiery sound, which are really nice for um, sort of autumn winter time. I've never actually used those in making my own candles. These are the wicks that I've used. Again, I will link them down below in the description box. Along with those, you're gonna need something to stick your wick to the bottom of your container. So I have these little sticky pads, which again, I will link down below in the description box for you. Right, so let's start with making the candle. First things first, you're gonna need a container. And one of the reasons why I thought it would be a good idea to start making my own candles is because I had so many containers, which I didn't want to throw away because a lot of them were quite visually pleasing. A lot of them were very expensive. And I think sometimes you pay more for the container than you do the actual candle. Um, not in this instance. This is just a cheapy 12.99 H&M candle. It was sun-dried linen. And the weight of this one is 500 and 82 grams. So this for me would be quite a small candle. Now, as you can see, I have already burnt this candle, used this candle. Uh, so I'm gonna use this container today to basically recycle it, to reuse it, and to show you guys my candle making process. If you wanna use one existing container that you have, the best thing to do once you've burnt your candle through is to pop it in the freezer overnight or for a few hours. You just wanna make sure that the wax really hardens in there. This is important in particular around this time of year when it's hot because the wax is gonna be really difficult to get out of the bottom of the container if it's just room temperature. You wanna freeze it to get it really, really cold so that it makes it easier to chip out. So essentially, once you take it out of the freezer, you're then just gonna to wanna to chip away at that wax. It will start to come away depending on what kind of wax has been used, but it should come away in big clumps. Then you're gonna be left with what well, I don't really know the technical term, but the wick holder at the bottom, the little bit of metal, you're gonna to wanna to try and ping that off. I just usually use a normal knife, like a, a cutlery knife, to try and ping that off the bottom. Obviously be very careful if you're using knives and scissors and sharp utensils, but yeah, it's a bit of trial and error to see what sort of works for you and what you can use to scrape out that wax. Then you're just gonna wash your container and dry it thoroughly so that you have 
your fresh container to start making your candle with. And in Blue Peter style, here's one I cleaned earlier. Right, so you've got your empty container. Let's pop the lid off. First thing we're gonna need to do is figure out how much wax we're gonna need to pop in here. So as I mentioned earlier, fortunately for me with this one, I do still have the label on the bottom. This is 582 grams that will fit in this container. If you don't know the grammage of your container, let's say you've just literally gone out and bought like a thick glass jar from somewhere, or you're using something which doesn't have any kind of measurements on it, then it's a little bit trial and error if I'm being honest. So I'm gonna measure out my wax, and the wax that I'm going to use is the Pro Soy wax, just because it's easier. I've got my little cup in here. First of all, I need to turn on my scales. Okay. And then I'm gonna measure out the wax. Right, so I've got 586 there, which is probably about Right, doesn't matter if I've got a little bit of extra because obviously you do get a little bit of shrinkage. So, first things first, we need to pop on a pan of water to boil, and this is so that we can pop our melting jug in there in order to melt the wax. So, I'm going to pop my melting jug in there. In fact, no, I'm not. I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to make a mess. And I'm just going to pop it on here so that I can pop the wax in there first. See, I told you it was really, really messy. I like to make a mess. Probably should have poured this in a little bit easier. But you need to... I don't really know the specific temperature of the water, but this is why I use my thermometer so much. Um, so you just need to get your water to the point where it starts to melt the wax. I wouldn't have it boiling, but you just need to have it on a heat level that gets your wax melting, but not boiling. You don't want to boil your wax. That is literally the last thing you need. Right, now the wax is in my melting jug. I'm just going to pop that in the water. You don't want your water to overflow your pan. It's just going to be heating up your melting jug. And then it's just down to a bit of patience. Make sure that you've got your thermometer to hand because as your wax, whether it be in block form or in those tiny little pellets, as that starts to melt and as it melts thoroughly and melts all the way through, you're gonna to wanna to use your thermometer to test the temperature. Right, so now whilst your wax is melting, it's a good time to prep your container with your wick. So I'm gonna use one of these long wicks because as you can see, my container is pretty tall. And there's lots of different ways you can attach your wick to the bottom, but as mentioned at the beginning, I use these little sticky pads. So I'm just gonna attach this to the bottom of the little metal wick holder don't know the technical term, peel off the sticky on the bottom and then when you're placing it in your container, if you've just got a one wick container, you want to go as central as humanly possible. So I usually just hold the wick as steady as I can until it sort of sticks and then just make sure that you press it down with your fingers so that it's pressed into place and then your wick is in there and ready. Now, one other thing that I need to do is make sure that the wick stays central in the container when I get to the point where I'm gonna be able to pour my wax in there. Now you can get, and I think I've actually got one in here and I've never used it because I don't have any containers this small. And I think it might be called a wick stabilizer, wick holder, wick centralizer. It is, I think, oh, will it fit in this? This might be the first time I've ever used this. No, it's too small. Basically, it's like a little metal 
plate that you thread your wick through into a small section and these bits if it were a smaller container would sit on the sort of edge of your glass and it holds your wick steady and central throughout so that when you pour the wax you can't just leave it like that because it moves around. I have not found one large enough so I have come up with my own unique method which is a bit of a hosh posh of things that I found around the house of keeping my wick in place. So to do my method I'm just using some garden twine cut it to size. I actually have a few bits which I've got pre-cut that I've used for other candles that I've made um, but I'm just going to use a fresh bit this time and then get some sellotape. Right, so I've got two little pieces there. Obviously if you have more than one wick and that depends on your container size then you're going to need more pieces of string, one piece of string. If you choose to do it this way, one piece of string per wick. So what I'm going to do is just loop the string around my wick and tighten it and then pull it to either side of the container to make sure that it keeps my wick central. And then using a piece of sellotape, I'm going to tape that in place. You might have to rejig a little bit if it moves. Mine's moved a smidge. Make sure it's nice and central. And then tape that in position. And there, it keeps the wick nice and central. I don't believe that's an official method, but it's the one that I found the most effective. And then one other thing you can do whilst you're waiting for your wax to melt, I'd say we've probably got maybe 10 more minutes left on that, is to prepare or just get ready the amount of fragrance oil that you want to use in your candle. So I'm going to go for this one today because I haven't tried this fragrance yet. It's called Coconut and Waterfall Blooms. Sounds magical. We're still in July, so do you know what? It's probably gonna be August by the time you guys watch this, but it's quite a summery scent. So I'm just gonna pull out the stopper. And again, to be honest, with fragrance oil, I think it depends on where you buy them from and always read the description when you're buying fragrance oils. Some of them are only compatible with certain types of waxes. Some of them have a different, uh, or some waxes have a different scent throw. Um, and they will often give you guidelines on how much fragrance oil to use um, in ratio with your wax. I kind of just wing it, to be honest with you. I like a nice strong smelling candle, so depending on how strong the fragrance oil smells in the bottle, very much depends on how much I put into the measuring jug. So what did I say was the size of my container? 500 and something? High 500s, wasn't it? So I think I'm going to put in 100 ml of fragrance oil. I've gone a little bit over, so I'll probably leave a little bit. Let me just pour some back. Yeah, about 100 mil. And then I'll see how I feel about that when I've mixed it in with the wax. You can always add more. And to be honest, if you add too much, it's just gonna be a really strong candle. Right, my wax has fully melted through now, so I'm actually gonna completely turn off the hob and I'm just gonna test the temperature. Um, I have been testing the temperature just to make sure that it doesn't get too hot and I had to adjust my hob because I felt like the temperature was rising quite quickly. So I'm just going through now and the temperature that I add my oil is 80 degrees and then I wait for it to cool to 75 and once it gets to 75, degrees that's when I then pour. Um, this I think was information I found on the uh, candle supply website that I use for the various oils and the various waxes. Again there's lots of different information for various waxes and fragrance oils that you're going to use so I would just go by those. Right I think I've reached the temperature now where I can pour in. I'm going to take pouring jug out of there and I'm going to just pour in 
my oil now into the wax. And I use my thermometer also as a little stirrer, just because I don't want to use another utensil and I need to keep testing the temperature anyway, so it's actually cooling down quite quickly. So I think I'm going to get pouring. I'm just going to pop it back in the warm water for a minute. So I think I'm going to add another little splash of fragrance oil just because it smells strong, but I like them really strong. to pour my wax into my container. This is where that lip comes in really handy. Just pouring it out. Hopefully I've measured the wax correctly. Got a little bit too much, but that's not a problem because I keep some really small little um, candle containers like a um, the little Yankee candle ones that you could get. I keep those so I can use that wax in there. So I'm going to pour it up to about that sort of height in the jar, leaving about a centimetre in the top. Now you might find, depending on the wax that you use, that your wick starts to bend a little bit. Don't fret. I often find that that only happens with this pellet wax, soy wax. With the one with the slight bit of paraffin in there, the parasoy, I don't find that this happens. But I just leave it for, say, maybe around an hour. Just keep an eye on it and wait for the wax to harden. As the wax does start to set from the bottom upwards, I just slightly adjust my little uh, contraption of wick holder. But essentially now, we just leave it to harden. Right, now whilst I'm waiting for this one to set, Blue Peter style, here's one I made earlier. So this one I actually made yesterday or the day before? Yesterday, I think. Um, so this one, now I can unravel or remove the strings which are holding the wicks in place because it has fully hardened and fully set. Once it started to set a little bit, I actually moved it into our downstairs toilet, which is one of the coolest rooms in the house, which again, during summertime, you can pick up and move your candle once it's set to a degree and it's not gonna pour boiling wax all over the place. Um, you can move it to a slightly cooler area if you feel that's gonna speed up the hardening process. So you could cut your strings if you wanted, but as I've said, I reuse my strings. So that's why I am just peeling them off and unraveling them from the position that they were on. Now this one is a slightly larger candle. I'll deal with that later. This is a three wick candle. Um, so now I use the same size wicks as I used in this candle. I'm just gonna trim those to size. So I've got some little wick scissors here, a little wick trimmer, and I'm gonna cut them to about half a centimeter above the top of the wax. Doesn't have to be precise. And there we go. And now you're actually supposed to leave your candles to cure and the curing time depends on the type of wax that you use, the brand of wax, etc. I usually leave mine again in a really cool part of the house for about three or four days before I burn it for the first time. I think you're supposed to leave them for about one or two weeks, but I haven't had any issues with mine leaving them for about three or four days. So I'm gonna go and pop this one back in the downstairs toilet to cure for a little bit longer before I give it its first burn. And here is the finished candle that I made during this video. I left this to cure for over a week in the cool of the downstairs toilet. And now I'm removing my makeshift wick stabilizer, making sure that I keep that twine so that I can reuse that on another candle at a later date. 
And then I need to trim the wick down to that ideal half centimetre length before it has its first burn, which on a candle of this kind of size, ideally needs to be around two to three hours, just so the top of the candle melts completely. And this will ensure an even burn down the container each time it's lit with no dips in the center. Now I've lost count of the amount of candles that I've made over the last nine months, but each one has been a success. And it's a great way to reuse your old candle containers time after time after time. It's also much more cost effective than buying candles, especially the really expensive ones. And you can mix your own scents to really make them personal to you. It could be essential oils or just the ready mixed fragrance oils that I've been using. Now it's a good idea to start small so try a small-ish candle like the one that I've made today and then when you've perfected your art and your method you feel comfortable then you could move on to bigger three four and even five wick candles if like me you like a big candle you can also buy or repurpose decorative pots to use as your candle containers like I've done with this one here just make sure that they're temperature appropriate first and obviously never leave a candle unattended Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.